today's rock study, I am painting a photo that I took in San Diego a couple of summers ago. And so the rocks there are covered in this beautiful green moss. There's some water, there's some really strong light and shadow in this image. So we're gonna try to capture all of that in this four by four inch square. My colors today are Gamboge Nova, Raw Umber, Turquoise Blue, Burnt Sienna, Sepia, and Payne's Gray. All of these, with the exception of the Burnt Sienna, are by Holbein. Burnt Sienna is a Daniel Smith color, and I have white gouache in this little palette, but I probably will not use that today. We're gonna try to do all of this in under 30 minutes, the sketching and the painting part, and sort of to imitate what would happen if you're painting on scene, and if you're painting everything a la prima all at once in real life. So to start, we're gonna try to get a quick sketch here first, just to block in the basic shapes. The first thing I notice is almost in the center of my composition, there's a rounded stone in here. And so I'm gonna start by just lightly blocking in where that stone goes. And already I can tell I placed that one up a little too high on the page. So something that might be helpful would be to locate the exact center of your square and then judge the location of your stone based on that. And in my reference photo, that stone is just a little below the center point. So there's a kind of an angled composition here where the stones are separating from the water. There's a stone here and then one here, and it creates this almost triangle separating the composition in half. There's a light shape right here. The most important thing will be to indicate where your darkest shadows and your lightest lights are going to go. And to preserve a couple of highlights, you'll wanna plan ahead for the lights. In watercolor, you always have to plan ahead for where your whites are gonna go so you can avoid those with paint, especially if you're not using the help of gouache or white acrylic or anything like that. At about the center point of my composition, there's this stone right here. And we see a set of three stones all right next to each other. I think before I decide on the size of those though, I should make sure that this very large stone in the back part of the composition is the right size and location. So the top of it emerges about halfway, comes down, and then there's this large shadow shape on the water right there, and we can see where the rock turns right here, but this is all gonna be dark and in shadow. There's a lot of bumpy texture on this rock. It is important to get a solid sketch before you start painting. So if you need to spend a little extra time on this portion of the project, definitely take your time here and make sure you're confident with your sketch before you start diving in with paint. It's a lot easier to erase pencil and start over with that than it is to try to fix your painting later. So with the addition of that, I can see that I made these stones too large. So I'm gonna mark the halfway point on this edge, and that's about where this flat stone comes across, and this large moss-covered one is laying on top of it. Like that. And it's a strong light shape right here and a light shape surrounding that one. There's a little blue pool of water right there and a highlight here and a dark shadow shape here. We're gonna need to leave out a lot of details if we wanna try to accomplish this in under 30 minutes. So that's why I'm just talking about shadow shapes and light shapes, and that's what I'm trying to sketch here. This would be the same if you're painting from life and you're sketching from life. You just wanna quickly block in the major shapes in light and dark, and then worry about color later. I see a really strong shadow shape right here, and a light shape right next to that. Dark shadow here. And then this stone overlapping. And I have to compare this the location of this stone to the center point of my composition, I think that's about right. Erase that first mark. Overlapping stone and a little pool of blue water reflecting the sky. 
And I can see my drawing is a little bit off. This is located in the wrong spot. I'm going to move that up and a little higher, right about there instead. There's more of a spaced out shadow shape between these two shapes. And then I'm going to create the flat top of this big rock in the foreground. And I am going to look at the light shape that I see. And it comes to a point here, curves down, and you see almost this, side, this M shape right there. And I'm not going to look too deeply into the shadows. I want to indicate where the light and shadow meet. And we see this rock coming up like that. A light shape there. This rock comes in front of that one. There's a dark shadow in this corner, and these two rocks are right in front of it. So I'm going to draw this shadow shape. It's kind of this horizontal line right there. And this rock here, this one, and a dark shadow like that. A bumpy shadow shape here, a light shape. A little bit of light raking across the top of that curved stone. And there's the foreground shape. Let's finish up these rocks here. Up in the corner, I'm going to draw this sloped rock coming like that. And it angles down towards this larger boulder. We see a lot of bumpy shapes in there. And for the sake of the composition, I think I'm going to leave out this little rock in the corner and just make that water. And just checking my measurements here. This one needs to come down a little bit lower. It's on the, almost the shape of a bread loaf here. So you may find you have to erase and start over. This is a fairly complex composition here that we're trying to do in a short amount of time. But if it's not perfect, don't worry about that. Shadow there. And a shadow here. This rock almost touches that one. And there's a shine right there on that one. Okay, so we got our sketch down. We are ready to start painting. The only brush I'm going to be using today is my Silver Black Velvet Size 8 Round Brush. This is a really versatile brush. It's great for doing these small paintings because it's large enough that it'll force you to not go too detailed, which is a good thing in this case. And with my colors here, you can see I have a set of primaries. They're very earthy. My turquoise blue, burnt sienna, and gamboge nova are going to be my primary colors. When I mix the gamboge nova and the turquoise blue, it's going to produce that beautiful green that you see on the rocks. And with the Payne's gray and the turquoise blue, I can produce a convincing water color. So I'm going to start with the light shapes on this one. I'm going to start with those light green tones on the rocks, and then we'll progressively start to go darker with our colors. So to mix up that green, we're going to take our Gamboge Nova and the turquoise blue. And you can see it produces this lovely spring green color. And I may need to mix up quite a bit of this. And so with that spring green, I'm going to paint the tops of these rocks in the sunlight. In some of these areas, it's not quite as green. So I'm going to come back to that in just a moment here with a different color that's not quite so bright. So right now, I'm just getting all the green mossy colors in that I see in the reference photo. Working pretty quickly here. Avoiding highlights. Watering it down a little bit for the top of this one. And so we're just filling in the light shapes right now where we see the green lichens or ocean growth on these rocks. And 
You may have to mix up a little more paint. Just make as much as you need. This isn't a big painting, so I think I have enough here just to cover that. I'm not going to concern myself too much with softening edges or anything like that. When you're painting quickly, and especially on location, working on edges and softening can be a luxury that you may not have time for because of the ever-changing light conditions and weather conditions that you're dealing with when you're painting outside. So try to think about laying down a brush stroke and leaving it alone and just putting one next to another. Now, as I mentioned, this color changes a little bit to more of a tan, sort of a bluish tan. It's a little bit hard to describe here. So I'm taking my raw umber and mixing in a little bit of that paint's gray, producing this earthy brownish color. Painting that right up and actually swiping along next to that green to let the two colors merge in the middle of that rock in the light shape. And I'm going to water it down a little bit for this rock back here. I'm really just going to cover most of the shape. We'll have to go over that again with a darker shadow color in a bit. This is just serving as a base tone. Grabbing a little bit of my sepia with some water mixed in. And I'm going to paint this rock shape over here. Just avoiding that highlight for now. You could also approach this the opposite way. You could start with the shadow shapes first and then paint the light shapes after that. The danger in doing dark to light is that watercolor easily reactivates. So if you were to touch the dark shapes with a lighter tone, the two colors could merge together accidentally and we don't necessarily want that. So for this particular one, I am starting with the lighter colors. Okay, I'm dipping into my sepia and burnt sienna for more reddish brown on this particular rock. Dipping in the water if I wanna lighten it up a little bit. Painting loosely freely, constantly shifting my grip on the brush in the direction that I'm turning it, depending on what edge I'm trying to produce. Grabbing a little more of that brown and applying it to this rock here. And along that edge, as this rock turns towards the shadow, you see more of that reddish brown. And so I'm really just kind of working in patches here. I started with the patches of green, and now I'm doing patches of brown, all still within our light shapes. This one isn't quite so reddish. It's a lot of texture, a lot of light catching on that one. Okay, so we may need to come back in and touch up other light shapes once we've got the shadows in, but I think I'll have more clarity too once I put in those darker shapes. So the next color is gonna be the water, and I'm gonna grab some Payne's Gray you could also use indigo, and I'm going to scoop up a little of my turquoise blue and mix it in there. So now we've got a lovely blue. It's not exactly like the reference photo, but I have a limited palette here, so I'm working with what I have. Okay, and with that blue, I'm going to paint in the water. If you want your water to look sparkling in the sun, leave a couple of highlights. You can let the water overlap the shadow shape. That's not a problem. You are going to go darker over that anyway. But here along the edge of this rock, I see some tiny little highlights where the water is sparkling and rippling. So 
I'm going to weave some little white shapes untouched by the paint. And interspersing more pure turquoise blue here and there. You don't see one solid color on the water. It's shifting colors depending on what's underneath. And so I'm adjusting my color based on those shifting colors in the reference photo. And over here again, I see some froth, some little dots of white sparkling on the water. More of a pure blue between these two rocks. Working more carefully as I approach the rocks, I want to make sure that my blue doesn't accidentally cover those up. Rinsing a little bit with more of a watered down tone here, and then grabbing some burnt sienna to mix in, suggesting the rocks underneath the water, muddying up the color a little bit on purpose. <laughs> When you have muddy colors, make sure it's on purpose. Okay, up here in the corner, as I said, I'm leaving out that one rock and we're just gonna paint pure water up here. So we'll paint that right up next to the rock and leave a couple little highlights again, suggesting the shimmering water. We'll go back in with darker ripples once that first layer dries. Now this edge, I want to meld completely in the shadow. So I'm gonna paint the shadow on the rock and the water all in one pass. So there's no hard edge there. And then here along this edge into the rock, I'm gonna take a mid-tone and use that to transition from dark to light. And then some brown just to make it look more earthy. And then continuing on with the water. Working super fast here again, trying to mimic what I would be doing if I was working from life. There's almost this frantic rush when you're painting something from life in nature, just to get it all down before the sun sets or before your scene changes, before a cloud covers it up and changes the light completely. There's this little pool right here I'm painting in with that turquoise blue. And a little bit of blue right here catching the light. And a tiny pool right here. And then finally one here at the very top. And so there's our water. We're gonna come in now and start to paint the shadow shapes while the water's drying. For the shadow shapes, I'm mixing up almost a pure black using my Payne's Gray and Sepia. I'm gonna start with the deepest, darkest shadow I see, which is the center point here in this rock. That's not quite dark enough. You want mostly pigment, just enough water to get it flowing for you. And I'm slowing down my pace as I paint around these rocks. I want the light separating from the dark to be a really hard, crisp line, just like you see in harsh sunlight in real life. And then you can speed up a little bit as you spread that paint around into the larger section. So this shadow shape comes around here I'm just looking and squinting at my photo and looking at the darkest shapes and seeing how they all connect and trying to paint it all quickly and in one pass. This may not be possible depending on how complex your subject is, but when you do have to cut off and separate certain shadow shapes, try not to leave any edges unresolved. Okay, on this side of the rock, it's a more cool blue color in the shadow. So I'm using more of a pure Payne's gray right there without mixing the sepia in. And you can see the difference 
in color temperature, just a little more blue. And if you want to introduce some of the turquoise blue in there too, you can. And so this is a very dark shape, dark mass. I'm going to leave a little highlight along this edge where we see the light catching on some of those crevices in the rock. And now I'm going to let my brush dance a little bit along this edge where the rock has all these crazy details. Squint your eyes at the reference and just try to pick up the main shapes that you're seeing and work quickly with the correct value. And even if it's not exact, it will come out looking really cool, really realistic. These little dimples in the rock are all so unique and interesting. I love painting rocks, especially in bright sunlight, because it's really just a light and shadow painting. And every rock, just like anything else in nature, is so unique and different and special. I'm filling in this corner completely with my dark tone. Mixing up some more dark paint. And I'm going to paint this rock here on the top of my composition. And I'm going to do more of a stippling motion with my brush for this rock. It's very bumpy. There's a lot of detail on it. And so to suggest detail without actually painting every detail, I'm using this quick blotting motion. This is an, also something you can use when you're painting trees or things like that that have complex foliage shapes. It's a great way to simplify. All right, now since I'm right-handed, it makes sense to work left to right. So I'm gonna finish up this shadow shape on the rock right over here. This may have been ambitious trying to do this in under 30 minutes, but that's okay. Something else you can do to create texture is to rake your brush, your almost dry brush across the surface of an area. And this is called the dry brush technique. And what will happen is that your brush will just pick up on the texture of the paper and miss little areas, creating this beautiful texture almost effortlessly. You do have to get a correct angle on it to get the effect to work for you. But you can see with just a gentle scraping motion, suddenly the rock is lovely and textured. I'm going to darken up this shadow here, make that more of a strong contrast in unity with the rest of the piece. You want to constantly be comparing your dark values and make sure that it all makes sense, that they all match. And since the water is dry now, we can start to add little ripples with our dark color. Don't go too crazy here. Again, the key is simplicity. We're going for just enough detail to suggest complexity. So a couple of little ripples, that was really all that needed. And moving on, continuing to paint shadow shapes. Hmm, I can see I missed a little sliver of water right here. So I'm gonna go back in with my blue, my turquoise blue and fill that in. Not sure how I missed that. We'll just paint a couple ripples to kind of connect it to the water shape above it. And a little bit of the burnt sienna to help connect it better. Okay, I'm gonna add some more texture to this stone using that dry brush technique. I'm just gonna scrape my brush across the surface. OK, 
continuing to paint dark shadows. This one I'm slowing down as I paint along the light edge. You'll want to use the tip of your brush and you can twist and turn your brush to maintain that nice fine point. Something you'll see me doing just kind of turning it in my hand because as you lay down paint the brush starts to flatten out. So this way you can maintain that point. Little shadow edge along there. Okay, I'm going to fill in this dark shape. It's almost a circular shape. You may have to dip the tip of your brush in the water to get the paint flowing again for you. And leave a light shape right above that one. Working so tiny here. Grabbing more dark paint, connecting that up to the light, creating texture with that blotting motion of the brush. And there's a couple little divots in this rock. I'm just going to paint those in with a little blotting motion again. Dark shadow right above this rock. And then this is another really strong shadow. When you're painting around all these intricate little details, this can take more time than you'd expect. <laughs> But you can see how we're really just painting light and shadow. So my black combination again is just my mixture of sepia and Payne's gray. If you have a particular palette you like to travel with, I'd love to hear about it. Leave me a comment and tell me what colors you use when you take your paints with you on vacation. I'm always curious to see what everyone's favorite palette choices are. I like to travel with the Winsor & Newton Cotman sketchbook set or sketchers set. It comes with a water brush and it's so tiny and compact and has all these great colors that are in amazing nature tones, which is perfect for plein air painting. So that's what I usually travel with. Okay, we're getting closer to finishing this up. We just need a couple more shadow shapes in here. This one's surrounding that pool, helping separate it, helping make sense of the shape. Filling in this little shadow. I'm grateful for my sketch here. It makes it a whole lot easier to just kind of color in everything when you know that you've done your best with your sketch and you can just be confident with your paint at this point. Now, of course, when you're sketching from life, you don't get a tracing option. You have to just draw what you see, but I can't stress enough how helpful and important it is to practice your drawing skills because even with paint, you're constantly drawing. The sketching and drawing isn't done with the drawing part. You're going to continually be adjusting and modifying and pushing around shapes with your paint too. Okay, so as we've put those dark colors in, I can see this rock needs to go a little darker, so I'm applying another layer just very loosely of burnt sienna over the top. This is where you can start to pump up some of your colors if you want to add little pops with your primaries. In this case, they're very natural primaries, but those pops of color do help it look even more brilliantly lit in the sunlight. I'm gonna paint this shadow shape. sort of a dome and be careful to avoid this highlight just in front of it. It's important to make your composition look 3D to preserve those little edges that are overlapping each other. 
to help our viewer make sense of it all. And if these little shapes don't exactly match what you're seeing, that's okay. No one else has to know. You can also change the composition to meet your purposes. Like I left out that rock in the corner. Now I am probably gonna add a few more little ripples up there, perhaps suggesting the shadow of the rock up above it. And then filling in sort of a dark mid-tone leading up to the highlight on this rock in the front. And then I see a cooler shadow, so I'm reaching for my Payne's Gray to complete this shadow shape. And then the shadow goes completely black here in the foreground. So I'm using that combination of the Payne's Gray and Sepia to produce my darkest black Just coloring it all in. I'm removing a little of the paint and then scraping my brush across the surface to create texture, and interest to that rock. It's not going to be completely smooth. And then same with these here in the front. Make sure you're holding your brush almost flat against the table to achieve this effect. And you don't want too much water or paint on your brush. or it may not work for you. Let's add a little to that one back there too. And then I'm gonna add a little pop of my turquoise blue to this rock, suggesting the curve. It's almost like the shape of a frog's head curving up and over. And then next to that, some more burnt sienna on the rock behind it. I think these pops of color are really adding lots of wonderful life and contrast and interest to the composition. And shape of that rock separates from that with a shadow. Almost done. All right, so to finish up this corner, these are all light shape rocks. They just need to have a little bit of brown in them. So very quickly painting over that one with burnt sienna. Yeah. And this shape is a little murky as it dried. I'm going to cover it with some more specific brush strokes. Okay, so there's our finished rock study. I hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial. I'm going to be doing more rock studies in the future like this. Let me know in the comments what you think. If this is your first time visiting my channel, welcome. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss any new videos, and I'll see you in the next tutorial.